All right, all right. Torchy's Tacos, everybody knows. Let's go ahead and grab a seat. Welcome to North Village Church. My name is Michael. It's great to see you. This morning, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one at the back, or you can go to our trusty devotional. Go to page 52. If you don't have a devotional, please take one. It's our gift to you. Amazon makes it so easy. Uh, So uh, be sure to take that. You see our sermons where we're going from now until August 22. Uh, We also have tablets we pass through the aisle, so if you could, maybe Sophia, if you could grab that, Sophia, get that uh, going on that tablet. These tablets are are how you get invited to our newcomer's lunch. We have a newcomer's lunch today. we got about five, six people coming, and it's just a way to get connected to our church family, and so take advantage of those tablets. This morning, we are continuing through our series called What About? And you can look through our devotional to see where we're going for the next five weeks. The first week, we talked about the role of women, and we talked about abortion, and we talked about those who have never heard about Jesus, and we talked about our favorite subject, sex, sex before marriage. You can find all of that on our YouTube channel. And this morning, we're talking about racism. Um, Talking about racism is incredibly difficult. Uh, This conversation is loaded with explosive language. Uh, But keep in mind that we're not trying to solve racism of the world over the next 30 minutes. (laughs) That's not our, our goal. We're just, honestly, in this whole series, we're just seeing, can we have these conversations with one another in our church family? By God's grace, we have some ethnic diversity. And uh, that means we're going to come into this conversation with different experiences uh, in life, uh, which means it's going to be easy to misunderstand one another. Uh, It's going to be easy to get frustrated, uh, easy to get confused. Therefore, we need to remember to lead out in our conversations this morning, one-on-one, in our groups. We want to lead out with humility. We want to lead out with patience. We want to lead out with a commitment to one another as we enter into this conversation. I know for me, I grew up in Dallas, Texas in the 1980s. I primarily grew up, I get a woo for the 1980s, yeah. I primarily grew up in apartments, which means uh, from a young age, I was exposed to different ethnicities and uh, economic structures. Uh, My friends were white, black, brown, and everything uh, in between. And, and we constantly talked about our differences from one another. And as young people, we definitely made fun of each other, made derogatory comments about one another's culture and uh, ethnicity. Therefore, when the conversation around racism started to work its way into our everyday uh, news cycle around 2016, my natural impulse uh, was to say, well, that doesn't apply to me. Racism was something that happened in the 1950s. It's 2016. Why is this such a big deal? But over the last five years, I've seen I have more to uh, learn in this area. I'm still learning about this conversation, and hopefully we can take uh, a step forward together as a church family as as we talk about these three things. We just want to define the conversation. Two, how does God's word respond? And three, how do we respond How do we respond practically? So let's jump into defining the conversation. Like many of our conversations, it's easy to get lost in communication. So let's frame our conversation with a definition to help us stay on the same page. Racism is when we violate thought, word, and deed, the divine truth, Genesis 21, 26 to 27, that all humans have equal dignity and worth. Uh, There are many ways this can take place in our lives today, but probably the conversation that's taken place the most often in our culture today is the tension between majority culture, white people in our culture, and people of color, minority culture. Maybe that's a new phrase, this idea of majority culture, Uh, It might be a new term, but the reality is, is every context we walk into every day has a majority culture influence, and if we're not aware of the majority culture influence, it's most likely because we are the majority culture influence, right? I was in Bogota, Colombia a number of years ago doing some pastoral training uh, for some people there. We had a break. I took a walk into the shopping district, and I got a little turned around at some point in my journey in Bogota, 
uh, Columbia. And so I started looking for landmarks that might be familiar. I started uh, looking for people that might be familiar. I started listening for languages that might be familiar. And so in that moment, I was reminded that I was the minority culture. Right? That's a small example of what it might be like for a person of color, minority culture, who is living in the U.S. majority culture. The landmarks are a little different. The social cues are a little different. And they're having to exert a little more energy to navigate that majority culture. Does that make sense? And the good news is, is that this isn't just a challenge based on the color of our skin. We are constantly navigating majority and minority cultures in a variety of areas in our lives, depending on the context that we find ourselves. Right? We might be a man in a room full of women. There's a majority and there's a minority. We might be a little overweight in a room full of six-pack abs. There's a majority culture influence. There's a minority, there's a, you feel that, right? You ever go to Dragon's Lair on a Tuesday night? And you will quickly find out majority and minority. And, you, and if you are not in the language, in the, in the system of Dragon's Lair, I mean, you, you feel out. And so that there are many ways opportunities for humanity to violate thought, word, and deed, the divine truth, Genesis 1, that all humans have equal dignity and worth. But for the sake of our time this morning, we're going to specifically apply this conversation to the color of our skin and specifically the tension between black people and white people. And we could talk about the experiences of Hispanics Asians, Native Americans, but we only have so much time. And the focus of our news today is primarily between black people and white people and the black person's experience in the United States historically. We could spend time going through charts, right, to, to try to capture the black person's experience historically in our country. We could look at stats uh, we, could, we could look at graphs, but I, I thought it might be helpful to kind of highlight that story by simply walking through a quick timeline of, of history. So lean in with me. Here's some, some history for us. 1525 to 1860, you have what's called the transatlantic slave trade. Twelve and a half million Africans are shipped to North America against their will so that an entire group of people are launched into our nation's history. Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. In the 1700s, the abolitionist movement, largely established by Genesis 1 that we referenced earlier, that all humans have dignity and worth, right? so that we see Emancipation Proclamation 1863. But let's just imagine what life would have been like for the black person's newfound freedom in 1863. We can imagine it's incredibly difficult. Very little education. No net worth. No social network. Life turned completely upside down. And then imagine 25 years, another, we'll call this the first generation. It's 1888. There's a brief period known as the Reconstruction Era where you see the first black lawyers, educators, doctors, but that period is brief. That ends in 1877. And I'm guessing in 1888, the, the primary focus for a black American is just survival. And you go forward another 25 years, 1913, second generation. We're just, trying to, we're, just, we're just trying to step into the past a little bit and feel what somebody's story might be like. 1913, your grandfather was a slave. I'm guessing that thought never left your mind. In addition, the Jim Crow laws of the South are in full effect. If you haven't read about Jim Crow laws, you definitely should. The oppression was so bad in the South that there's historically an event called the Great Migration where six million black Americans migrate from the South to the North to flee from oppression, oftentimes 
to only find more oppression in, in the North. So again, you have to assume at this point that the average black person recovering from slavery has very little education, very little net worth, very little social network, so that basic skills in life, things that we just would take for granted in some cultures, would like healthcare, parenting, marriage, budgeting, they're at a bare minimum. Fast forward another 25 years, it's 1938. Jim Crow laws are still in full effect. An average black person might be getting some education, but again, you have to assume that it is incredibly challenging to create stability. Perhaps there's a, a part of us this morning that's thinking like, why are we doing this? Why does this stuff matter? Listen, we're not trying to feel sorry for people, but it would be naive to say to ourselves that their story is just like our story, right? We're, we're just trying to understand the unique challenges that are in our history, and seeing a broad scope can help us understand the tensions that are in our conversations today. Fourth generations, 1963. We're on the verge of civil rights movement. Jim Crow laws are about to be dismantled in legislation, but we know human beings don't change overnight. So maybe good things are on the way, but it's still likely incredibly difficult to get a good education, to get a growing net worth, to get a strong social network. Fifth generation, it's 1988. Sure, some access to education. There's some net worth. We're just talking about a story of a people as a whole. There might be some social network, but it doesn't take a strong imagination to assume there's still going to be incredible challenges at the parenting level, at the marital level, at the judicial level, so that we get to 2013. It's so six generations. Like it's so easy sometimes in a, in a conversation uh, in our history to think, oh, that was so long ago. But what I hope you see in this timeline, it's like, uh, it's not that long ago. There's still a ripple of effects in our, in our country today. So what does this mean? So many times today, we assume that if a person has problems in life, it's because that person made decisions that created those problems. And, and there is some truth to that statement, but... That would be overly simplifying the greater complexities of life. And as a follower of Jesus, we would do well to try to understand not only a black person's story, but we want to we understand everybody's story. And the reason we want to do that is because everyone has dignity and worth and value because we're created in the image of God. Of God. So that's just trying to frame the conversation for us. Let's go into how does God's word respond? How does a follower of Jesus respond to this conversation? Before we read God's word, I just, we need to acknowledge that it's, it's easy for our hearts to push back on the conversation of racism. None of us want to see ourselves as racist. Right? I think we all like to think of other people who are racist. We love to point the finger at other people. But in God's word, we see this isn't a 2021 problem. It isn't a United States problem. It isn't a white person's problem. It isn't a slavery problem, but it's a humanity problem. Looking at Genesis 1, 26, 27. I'll read, you follow along. Then God said, let us make man, that's humanity, make man in our image according to our likeness and let them, that's humanity, rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man, humanity, in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female, he created them. God God's word makes it clear that all, all of humanity is valuable, period. Because we are made in his image. Our culture says humanity is valuable if we are physically attractive, if we are socially popular, if we are financially wealthy, or if we're compassionate or caring. And our value in our culture, it changed 
It changes depending on the, the, the shifting of the winds. You know this, right? In the 1950s, right, it would have been culturally valuable to be a war hero. People are coming back from World War II. Those, those people would have been elevated, but as early as the 1960s, War heroes would have had no value. You had Vietnam War that was looked down upon, and, and people started to value social activism. In the 1970s, that changes. You had things like Watergate, a distrust in government, politicians, and so that indifference, skepticism is what's elevated and valued. But in the 1980s, it's pop culture that's elevated in values. In the 90s, it's making money. In the 2000s, it's patriotism. 9-11. And so that's what's elevated in our country. In the 2010s, it's, it was social media influence. In the 2020s, it looks like it's back to social activism. So that the value of our day, it's constantly blowing and shifting. But God's word teaches us, Genesis chapter 1, that our value in humanity is because we are made in his image. Being made in his image means that humanity carries royal and relational implications as we share in God's stewardship over creation. You see that in Genesis 1. It carries, simply being alive carries royal and relational implications as we share in God's stewardship over creation. So that in Genesis 1, we see it isn't just kings and priests who are crowned with glory and honor, but all of humanity is crowned with glory and and honor because all of humanity is made in his image. You with me? That's why we care about life. That's why we care about how people are treated at our borders. It's not political. That's not what motivates the follower of Jesus. It's Genesis 1 that motivates us. That's why we care about how many children are in orphanages. That's why we care about how many abortions happen every day. It's not political. It's because all of human life is valuable. This is God's design from the very beginning. But we know Genesis 3 is coming. We don't have time to get into it this morning, but in Genesis 3, you should read it on your own. If you, if you don't know, Genesis 3, sin enters into the story and fractures, it breaks everything Genesis 1 created to be good so that as early as Exodus, we see racism enter into the story as God's chosen people, Israel, experience enslavement and oppression. So that the idea of one group of people overpowering another group of people, well, that's not just in our nation's history, but that's a pattern throughout all of human history. Right? Sometimes in our, in our culture today, if you're on TikTok, if you watch the news, you might hear kind of this question presented to our culture today is, um, is it a few bad apples or is it the whole tree? You guys heard this, where you're talking about police, talking about government, politician, teachers, church, right? Are we talking about a few bad apples or are we talking about the whole tree, right? Listen to me, Genesis 3 makes it clear. We're not talking about just a few bad apples, Genesis 3 makes it clear. We're absolutely talking about the whole tree. But are we under the impression that the next tree is going to be any better? Does that make sense? Like young people, teenagers, listen to me. Deconstruction is a narrative in our culture today. You're feeding on the concept of deconstruction, whether you know it or not, right? Our culture loves to deconstruct, to critique everything right now. We're going to deconstruct the police, deconstruct our government, de deconstruct the church, deconstruct the, the family unit. We're going to criticize. It's all horrible. Kind of just sit in our chairs and, and point, point the finger, right? It's easy to deconstruct. You got to know that. Be, please listen. It's easy to deconstruct. What's hard is to construct. 
right? What's hard is to create. And we can be sure no matter what we construct in humanity, we will see brokenness. We will see racism. We will see oppression of one group over another group, right? Because this is a pattern throughout all of human history. It doesn't mean it's okay. It doesn't mean it shouldn't bother us. It, it doesn't mean that God's not bothered. It's not what he created. He created Genesis 1, right? But it's clear how easy it is for racism, prejudice, bias to slip into humanity. And the clearest picture of this in Scripture is in the life of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter. And, and so I need you to lean in because we're going to fly through some Scriptures. But I, I just want you to see how it's showing up in the life of Paul and of Peter. We're going to go to Philippians 3, verses 4, 5, and 6. This is the Apostle Paul speaking in the New Testament. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, this is how Paul sees himself before Jesus. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews. So as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. All right, this is how Paul sees himself before Jesus, and he's describing himself as a prideful person based on what? His outward accomplishments. Do you see it? He's drawing attention to his ethnicity, nation of Israel, Hebrew of Hebrews, so that before Jesus, Paul sees himself as superior in his ethnicity, in his heritage, in his cultural background. That's racism. This is what we do in humanity. We find something in our lives that is uh, maybe unique or different, and, and, and we want to use it to look for significance and meaning and purpose. It might be our career. It might be our physical appearances, our intellect, our finances, our family background, our color of skin, our ethnicity. And then we tell ourselves, at least I'm not like those people. It's racism. In my life, personally, I, I, I'm a registered member of the Cherokee Nation. I don't know if that means anything to you, but I'm a registered member of the Cherokee Nation. And when I read about the Cherokee Nation or I interact with the Cherokee Nation, I find it easy to stir up feelings of isolation, of, of separating myself from other groups of people, even thoughts of superiority, of, of how my heritage makes me maybe a little bit better. And, and I see, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I, 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 I see these feelings kind of stirring up where I want to create division between myself and those people, whoever those people might be. Like it's just, it's, it's, it's incredibly slippery as it kind of enters into my thoughts that of division. And it doesn't mean our heritage and our background or ethnicity is wrong, but like Paul, we would do well to see how easy it is for us to look for significance in outward accomplishments. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. This is Paul in Christ. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly, his past, blasphemer, persecutor, violent, aggressor, yet the gospel, I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Do you see the change in his perspective through faith in Jesus? Before, Paul is full of pride, tribe, background, education, ethnicity, all of it, outward. And then he meets Jesus in his mindset changes so that Paul's confidence is in Jesus alone. Listen to me, it doesn't mean ethnicity, background, and heritage aren't important. They are important. 
Sometimes people will say, yeah, that's right, in Jesus, we're all the same. No, we're not. <laughs> no, we're not all the same. Our cultures and heritage and are all beautiful, godly gifts, but they aren't what's most important. That's why all of us are susceptible to elevating ourselves over one another based on the color of our skin and falling into racism where we violate thought, word, and deed, the divine truth that all humans have equal dignity and worth because we are created in his image. Let's look at the apostle Peter. This is Acts 10. I'm, we're jumping right in, so lean in with me. A voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times. And immediately the object was taken up into the sky. It's a little complicated, but in Acts chapter 10, Peter, the apostle Peter, has a vision. And the, the, the Lord teaches Peter this, through this vision that all these foods that used to be unclean as a faithful Israelite, now that he is in Christ, those foods are clean and free to eat. And the Lord says to Peter, eat. You see that in verse 14, Peter's initial response is no. You see that? Peter's culture, Israelite, his background has influenced him so greatly that when God himself is speaking to Peter, Peter's natural impulse is to say no. What does that mean? I mean, I mean Peter walked with Jesus. Peter's definitely indwelled with the Holy Spirit. Peter's having a conversation with the Lord three times. And still, you can see that the bias, the prejudice, the impartiality is slipping into his thinking. Look at verses 25 to 28. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him. Cornelius is a Gentile, different ethnic group, fell at his feet and worshiped Peter. Peter's in Christ. Peter says, no, stand up. I'm just a man. Don't worship me. 27. As he talked with him, he entered, Peter enters and finds many people assembled. And he said to them, you yourselves know that it is forbidden for a Jewish man to associate or visit a foreigner. This is Peter's thinking. This is his background. And yet God has shown me that I am not to call any person unholy or unclean. You with me? These are two examples coming from the life of Paul and Peter. And the reminders, we can be walking with Jesus. We can be walking in the spirit and still not see the destructive layers of racism creeping into our hearts and our minds in ways we never thought possible, right? It doesn't mean we should walk around in shame and guilt, but it does mean that we can't just dismiss racism as something that was in the past, right? I mean, if, if we're on guard, as, for those of us who are in Christ, if we're on guard against sexual immorality, against gossip and slander, against greed, why would we also not be on guard of how race, racism might be slipping into our thinking and, and showing up in ways we could never imagine? Let's talk about how we respond practically. How do we respond practically? I'm gonna give you 10. I mean, it's just we're gonna fly through these things, but I wanted to try to give you 10 practical ways that we can respond to this conversation today. Number one is we pray. I, I, it bothers me when people, uh, just prayer. Prayer is powerful. We want to pray that our hearts would be softened to how racism might show up in our lives today, in our, in our city today, in our, in our country today. We want to pray that the Lord would give us eyes to see. We want to pray. We want to empathize. We want to bear one another's burdens Right? To bear one another's burdens is to lean in, to hear one another's story. That's Galatians chapters six, right? We wanna 
listen to one another's experiences, especially if you're coming from the majority culture. We want to we want to lean in to try to hear somebody else's experiences that would be different than ours. We want to empathize. We want to share our stories with one another. I know it takes time. You can't do it over one lunch. We got to build bridges with one another, but, but what, a, what a value to, to learn from one another's past experiences as a church family. For we want to submit our experiences to God's word. Experiences are, are wonderful, but our, our experiences are not our ultimate authority, right? That all of our experiences ultimately fall under the authority of God's word. And so we want to make sure that we're filtering our experiences through God's word. Number five, we can't freak out when people don't agree, especially around this conversation of racism. Do you feel this impulse of like, if, if we're not on the same page with somebody around the subject of racism, you just want to slam the door? I feel that. You just want to cut them off? Like, I don't even want to do anything to do with you. Just like, uh. And then get on social media and be like, uh. uh. <laughs> oh, no. We can't freak out. Right? Let, us, let us remember that there, there may be areas where we're in disagreement as we're navigating this conversation, but this conversation isn't, isn't the central part of our lives. It's just one part of our lives, and that there are many, 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 many other areas where we do have agreement. We do have common ground, and we want to make sure we're not losing sight of that, those many, many areas in the light of this conversation. Number six, we want to stay in the conversation. When we talk about racism, it's easy to feel isolated. It's easy to feel different. It's easy to feel superior or inferior. And, and we want to stay in this conversation because of what we talked about earlier, that our greatest identity is not in our ethnicity, but it's in Christ. And so stay in the conversation. Number seven, what about groups like Black Lives Matter? God's word absolutely teaches us that black lives matter. That's, we don't even have to debate that. So that doesn't always mean that we can align ourselves with every organization. And when you look at the organization as black lives matter, there are values in that organization that, that do not align with God's word. So as a church family, we're not gonna be able to al align ourselves with an organization that doesn't align with God's word, but we absolutely believe black lives matter. Number eight, what about critical race theory? Perhaps some of us have never heard this term, uh, but it's, it's in the news more and more uh, these days. Uh, and if you, if, if you are hearing about it, you're likely hearing about it in one of two ways. Critical race theory is either the hope for humanity. Critical race theory is going to save us or critical race theory is going to destroy our country, right? It's, it's either one or the other. And I would tell you it's, it's both. There are absolutely things that we can learn from critical race theory. All truth is God's truth. And so it, 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 there are layers that can help us empathize with different people groups that we might not be familiar with. There are things that we can benefit, but there are also things that we need to be incredibly careful with, with critical race theory. Maybe we can talk about it more at a later time, but, but now more than ever, we, we just can't kind of take in information. We need to double click. We need to move slow. We, we need to... Who wrote that article? Who is that person? We need to ask questions. We need to examine now more than ever. Number nine, we want to be agents of reconciliation. I mean, God's word teaches us that. In Christ, we are ambassadors. We are agents of reconciliation. He is absolutely about justice. And so we want to think to ourselves, how in my life am I participating in God's heart? This can't just be a theoretical conversation. What does it look like practically? How is it showing up in our calendars, our finances? Immediately, we tend to go to the global level, national level, and how we're going to solve 
injustice in, you know, at that level, but, but I, I would just encourage you to think about much smaller. Like, look at, look at your circle, look at your city, look at your state, and begin to think to yourself, what does it look like for me to participate as an agent of reconciliation? And, and, and maybe it, it, it means that you're going to, to volunteer, uh, to mentor, to tutor, you're crossing racial barriers, that you're coming alongside the elderly, that you're voting uh, for specific people I- at the local level. Maybe that means you're running for office at the local level, but th- that you're getting involved in, in different ways and learning about our judicial system, learning about how our city is structured, that, that we, we can't settle for just kind of being bystanders, but that God's word is calling us to engage, and so practically, we need to own that. Last one, we need to seek out opportunities of diversity. We can't settle for our own little circle of familiarity. As a local church, that's something we need to own. We need to acknowledge that it's, it's likely that we're going to drift towards people who look like us, think like us, educated like us, live like us, that's just, so we, we can't be passive about this. We have to be intentionally thinking, how am I layering my life with diversity, educationally, economically, color of skin, and thinking about it at the church level? Uh, I, I don't necessarily see us segmenting based on the color of our skin, uh, but I definitely see us segment, segmenting based on stage of life, economic backgrounds, educational backgrounds, because it's easy to drift towards people who are familiar to us. Therefore, now more than ever, we need to seek out intentionally diversity. In the the end, I I wish I could tell you at North Village Church, uh, you'll never feel misunderstood. You'll never feel out of place. I wish I could tell you, you'll never feel marginalized. But we all know that's not true. Right? That the hope for humanity is not North Village Church. But the hope of the world is Jesus. Jesus does see you. Jesus absolutely values you, understands you, accepts you. And Jesus has come to take all that pain, all that hurt, all that misunderstanding, all that, that, that injustice that's happening in our world upon himself at the cross and he conquers it in the resurrection and he calls us his. That's the gospel, that we are called his. We are not just called his individually. We are called his as a body and that our greatest identity as a people, is Christ. That we don't have to look for outward accomplishments to add value to our lives, but Jesus says we have value because he created us, he died for us, and he purchases us at the cross. That's the beauty of the local church. This is, this is the hope that we have in the local church. Our culture right now is looking for justice, and transformation, and hope. Our culture is longing for, do you know what our culture is longing for? Heaven. Our culture is longing for heaven. The only way that's going to happen, the only way we get a taste of heaven on earth is in Christ. So might we respond to that this morning? Might, Might every one of us here today trust in Jesus? If you've never done that, do that now. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart and you will be saved. Trust in him. We're gonna celebrate communion this morning. We're gonna practice what we've been talking about, right? That we're a body. And so we're gonna come together as a body and we're gonna celebrate communion. At the front, you'll see those little juice packets. There's a little wafer in there. If you're uh, not comfortable, you can use that or you can take the cracker and you can dip it in the juice. That cracker is 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 a symbol of uh, Jesus' body. That juice is a symbol of, of Jesus' blood. And as our worship team comes to the front, and we're gonna celebrate communion and, and you're gonna come forward and you're gonna dip that cracker, you're gonna take that little cup, and we're gonna celebrate the life we have in Jesus that as you're coming forward, you're not coming forward as an individual, 
You're coming forward as a body, as the collective body of Christ with different skin colors and economic and education and family and heritage and ethnicity in Christ. We're going to celebrate that. And listen to me, if you're sitting there this morning and if there's tension between yourself and somebody else in the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 11 teaches us, go to that person. Don't come forward in the celebration of communion with anger, with bitterness, with hardship toward one another, but experience forgiveness that's made available in Jesus. Forgive one another. If you have to, get up from your chair and go to that person and seek their forgiveness. Don't come forward and celebrate something practically that's not true in our hearts in reality. And so do that. That's the gift of Jesus. That's the hope of the gospel. Listen, if you've yet to come to faith in Jesus, if you're not ready to do that today, then we ask you to hold off. Please don't come forward. But if you have, then I'm gonna pray. And you come and you celebrate. You close your eyes, you bow your head. Well, Father in heaven, we come before you right now and we just confess, like these conversations we're going through, like nobody, we don't want to talk about these things. We just want to kind of close ourselves in a room and just veg out and not think about it and because and, and, it's overwhelming and it's scary. And yet your word invites us to, to talk about these things and not only to talk about it, but to find answers and to find hope. And that comes in Jesus. I pray you would help us to grow as a church family, that we would grow in this conversation, that we would be aware, be, become more aware of, of our stories with one another, that it would stir up in us empathy for one another, that the hope of the gospel would be highlighted in one another, and that there would be such beauty that there would be such brightness in this church family that it would ripple out of this church family into the streets, into 78757, into North Austin and Central Austin and, and all over greater Austin because your word is powerful. Your word is alive. It's in you that we hope. And so you're invited as a church family. Please come forward. Let's celebrate the life we have in Jesus. Amen.